So, to finish this chapter then, we go to uh, font style node. All right, so the font style node is a child of the text node. That's the only thing that a font style affects is, is our text node. And it can define uh, both the size of the text, the family, and directions for layout, up, down, left, right. Uh, uh, and that's necessary for internationalization. For multiple languages, you may need to go forward or backwards to uh, get them to display properly, like uh, uh, Oriental languages or Hebrew or Arabic. Uh, they don't go left to right, top to bottom, like uh, we're used to in English and the Romance languages. Okay, and uh, there's an interesting example here on how to do it. The uh, updated slides have a link to this. And uh, this is a great scene here uh, where we're using X3D as the interface to, to test these guys. Uh, so if we justify at the begin, like we have right now, green, we can uh, cross this top row. We can change it to justify first, justify middle, and justify end. You can see the text in the middle switch to match that combination, as does the color. So, uh, if we go top to bottom false, that would have it read up the screen. Uh, left to right false flips it around the other way. And we can change the uh, justification, although that doesn't seem to be working very well today either. Okay, in any case, the exhaustive way to look at all of this is with the pictures that are in the spec. And let's go find that. So to experiment with the spec, let's uh, launch the help in X3D edit. And I'll take us there. We'll open up the X3D specifications and then abstract functionality. Okay, and then we're going to go into architecture components. And then we'll find the text component, which is number 15. And then we'll find the uh, picture in here. Here we go. These are some pretty busy pictures, but uh, pretty thorough as well. There we go. These uh, figures are reproduced in the textbook and they show the different ways that text can align. Let's, uh, let's jump to the online version and see if that renders a little bit better. So I went to the top link on the X3D specifications page, clicked on that, and oops, that's not working the way I want it. I wanted that to jump to the outside browser, so I'll just go there directly. So here we are looking at it in the web browser instead of the help system. Text component number 15. And we've got a full up description of each combination. And then we have the charts showing different layouts. Okay, so what I do not recommend you do is memorize all this darn stuff. Rather, uh, know that the reference is there, and if you ever do need to do some uh, fancy layout, either for a special effect in how you're portraying something, or to internationalize, then you can go to this in the book or in the spec and figure it out. Okay, so... What 
else then? In this slide here, we see what the interface looks like. Uh, and you can just use the text note example to click on the font style. And rather than make you type in all of these uh, pesky little string uh, enumerations for what the different values are, we give you a drop down menu and that lets you change them. It's, it's helpful to see what other fonts are supported. Well, we have our default, which is uh, serif, which indicates that the characters have a little squiggle on the end of them. That's uh, font jargon, font, font terminology. Sans means they're a cleaner uh, font. Typewriter is a synonym for courier font or a, a fixed width font that uh, all the characters, regardless of what letter they are, will take up the same space on the screen. So if you wanted to make your text vertically aligned perfectly, regardless of font, then you could use uh, the typewriter font. And uh, let's pull that up just to see where it is. So there's the text node. There's the font style that's a uh, child of the text node. And I'll right click and edit that guy. And uh, okay, I picked up my text node. I don't want that. I want the font style node. Here we go. And you can see the, uh, the families are serif, sans, and typewriter. Actually, I see a way we can improve the interface here. We could uh, make this a pull-down list that is overwritable. So we'll do that in the next build. The rest are not overwritable. They're just fixed values because these are the only ones. As before, we have independent control of the horizontal and the vertical so that we can comply with each language. And under style, we have some helpful choices. Plain, bold, italic or the combination of bold italic. Size, this is uh, always uh, interesting. Uh, that's a one meter font <clears throat> when we default to one. It's one in meters, not points. And uh, points are usually uh, what most font fonts are listed in, but those are a page relative sizing. We're, we don't have a page concept here, so instead we just made it unit one meter, which turns out to be pretty close to what the other geometry primitives are and turns out to be pretty good for most scenes that we do. If we're using big text in there, it needs to be readable. So uh, about the only thing you ever need to do with font style is if it's being some kind of a sign or a notation, then shifting to middle middle is a good thing. But if you want to get fancier, you certainly can do that. Okay, so I think we're summing up now on our geometry primitives. We have the tooltips for font style, which gives you a little more detail, including uh, references in there if you want to uh, find out about the different language codes and fonts. Uh, then we have our summary page for our geometry primitives nodes. That, uh, key takeaway points are that we reinforce this design pattern every time. Shape contains the geometry and then its corresponding appearance and material. And for the geometry primitives, at least, we give the browsers a lot of leeway. They get to decide just how many polygons they want. We call that tessellation, the creation of polygonal approximations from uh, a uh, platonic solid, or geometric solid. Here's another view of that same scene. And this is sort of look ahead at the next chapter here. We're using, uh, in this picture, X3D Edit 3.1, the prior browser. We can see the scene graph layout here pretty clearly. And the pattern appears over and over. We looked at this early in the chapter of geometry, appearance material. But then we give each one a parent transform node to translate it so that they don't all step on top of each other. And that's the result. Okay, uh, regarding this, a summary of the further resources that we have identified in this chapter. 
Uh, you can get to each of the tooltips via these links. We've started peeking at the X3D specification whenever uh, we want an extra uh, opinion, a second opinion, or an extra insight into how things work. If, uh, if you're uh, making uh, X3D bets up at the sports bar, this would be the uh, reference of choice. Uh, what's the right answer to a given X3D question? And uh, here are some of the pictures that we uh, pulled out of the X3D spec. We were able to get permission to do this since the spec is published openly. Uh, we're happy to, Web3D Consortium is happy to approve uh, requests to republish as long as uh, you're not charging for the specification per se, but rather whatever else you're adding. Since this is the first uh, serious chapter in the book of authoring, there's a lot of related concepts. We look ahead at them here, uh, jumping around. It's hard to build a basic scene with only two or three nodes, so we've uh, carefully hidden you from some of the uh, uh, moderate medium scale details, but this is where we look ahead at them and where we'll cover them in each of the chapters. And here's the listing of the other geometry nodes. Remember, primitives are simply our first chapter of geometry. We have uh, four of them total. We're listing all the node names here. In fact, if you get through the whole book and you master all of these, you'll find that there are still a few more uh, non-uniform rational B-splines, NURB surfaces, there are a couple of others that are uh, uh, advanced topics. Okay, we list them right here. Geo elevation grids, another good advanced geometry node. We're using that one in X3D Earth. And as ever, you can find all of this stuff online at the specifications page. So, in summary, shapes are good, but they don't say much by themselves. They simply contain other geometry and group it with the corresponding appearance material. And we have lots of good resources. Okay, so your recommended exercises for this week and uh, uh, for class projects is become familiar. And since we do want one each week, it would be good for you to send something, comma, anything to the class list to document your progress last week. At the end of the first week, we'll see uh, Making a simple object of some sort using shapes is a great thing and uh, some surprisingly good shapes are possible but you'll need some of the tools in the next chapter, particularly transform, so that all your geometry does, doesn't go on the same place but you can build some larger ob object using those uh, primitives. And if you want some ideas on that, there are two links here. Some of the more notable uh, student projects we've stuffed in the basic archive under student projects. Also, there's some uh, great examples. Uh, well, if you like surfboards and spark plugs, they're, they're great examples. Uh, I do. Maybe you do, too. But you can go look there. Okay, and here are the references that we used in this chapter. All right, so that concludes uh, geometry chapter. Oh, I guess I should mention uh, two more slides that appear in every slide set. The Creative Commons open source license applies to these slides. This says the content is free for any use. Uh, as usual, uh, it can be in, embedded in free works or in for pay works. It's just that the for pay works can't charge anything more than a modest duplication charge if they're using the free materials. So somebody else can't sell my slides just as is. Okay, similarly, our open source for all of our software in X3D Edit and for our scenes that we uh, accept and put into the online archives, these are all open source, free for any use. And if you read the uh, fine print on this, what are required? redistribution conditions, well, it's pretty simple. You give credit to the contributors and uh, you don't use our names in vain. You can't say that, well, this is all endorsed by the Naval Postgraduate School. No, if you were, if you were going to ask for that, that would be a separate request. Uh, an interesting thing, since uh, many of the students here at NPS, you, you folks might go on to become 
program managers, supervisors of uh, important projects, sometimes very expensive projects. Uh, you might, uh, if you study the issues of open source, you might say, well, this is a pretty lightweight license. Well, how does this protect the government from anybody reselling things? How, do, how does this prevent somebody from reselling the model I build in this class back to me as a program manager three years from now? That would be a good question, right? Maybe uh, answer, I don't want my work stolen. So how, how, do you, how does this accomplish that? Well, since somebody is required to include the license, and the license specifically says that it, you may not charge for it, it would be pretty hard for some company to uh, do that and, and withstand any kind of legal scrutiny whatsoever by, by a government auditor or by whoever wanted to do it. Further, uh, the courts have shown that uh, uh, companies that don't respect open source licenses or don't respect other terms and other licenses are liable to have all of their own intellectual property licenses revoked. There are examples in case law for that. So uh, uh, a company whose, whose entire reason for being depends on its intellectual property uh, incurs great risk if they uh, simply ignore an open source license. They could lose everything that's of value to their company. So these are pretty strong protections, as it turns out. If you would like to learn more about that, there's, there's tons of great books out there. Uh, the best I, I might recommend would be uh, the O'Reilly book on open source software. Uh, we'll make sure that's in the, uh, the notes underneath this. And uh, in fact, maybe it is. Maybe not. We'll make sure. It's the one with the cops and robbers on the front. And so that can give you plenty of uh, case studies of just how well this works. Okay, that's it. Now,